To understand the proposed Murray-Darling Basin Plan, it helps to appreciate the recent history that has impacted Australia's iconic basin. In this video, David Driverman of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority reveals the history and effect people have had on the basin since European settlement. Aboriginal people lived sustainably in the Australian landscape for thousands of years and yet in a little over 150 years European settlers have changed the landscape and have used the natural resources of the basin to levels that are not sustainable. We cleared the forests, we replaced the native grasses, we've introduced grasses and with cereal crops we brought in cows, sheep, rabbits and other pest animals. We built large numbers of farm dams and increasingly we turned to irrigation to make land on floodplains and close to rivers more productive. All of these things have had major impact on the operation of our rivers and the health of our rivers. Governments built major dams to store water from one year to the next to try to level out the extreme variability in rivers. In the process, we changed many of our rivers from predominantly winter and spring to summer and autumn flowing. As the consumption of water increased, the flow to the sea decreased, resulting in increasing periods of high salinity in the lower lakes in South Australia. To prevent this change, we built barrages to prevent salt water entering the lakes. So, having supposedly guaranteed that the lakes would always be fresh, we then connected Adelaide's water supply to the River Murray, to the point that in periods of drought, up to 90% of Adelaide's water supply is sourced from the Murray. As demand for water for irrigation increased, we built more dams and made the existing dams larger. And we also connected the Murrumbidgee and Murray rivers to the Snowy River through the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme, diverting more water west to turn the desert green. The drought of 1967 should have been the wake up call that something was wrong. Instead, our response was to build another dam. We built Dartmouth in northeast Victoria, the largest storage in the basin, to drought proof the Murray. We also continued to hand out more water entitlements and encouraged increased use of the entitlements previously handed out. Now Dartmouth supposedly drought proofed the Murray, but in 2007, 2008 and 2009 we found that it was really only effective for a one year drought and definitely was unable to sustain irrigation for the second, third and fourth year of extreme dry sequence. A major salinity study in 1970 indicated the emerging extent of the salinity problem and was one of the drivers for the formation in the late 1980s of the Murray-Darling Basin Commission to take for a first time a basin-wide perspective on issues, not just a Murray-centric view. The, one of the first tasks for the Murray-Darling Basin Commission was to uh, prepare a salinity and drainage strategy and we've spent the next 20 years implementing that strategy and building particularly salt interception schemes to prevent saline groundwater from entering the river. And we've done a lot of irrigation and land management reform to also uh, reduce the salinity in the river. In 1981, the Murray Mouth closed, requiring considerable effort combined with a flood to reopen it. Algal blooms, particularly in the Darling in 1992, but more recently across most of the rivers in the basin, are an indication that something's wrong. The prolonged drought of 1996 to 2010 resulted in the basin being a closed system for almost nine years, from 2001 to 2010, with virtually no flow to the sea in that period. The Murray Mouth would have closed again in 2002 without a major intervention program where two dredges worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week for several years. 
In the end, one dredge continued to be needed to keep the Coorong connected to the sea until major floods arrived in late 2010. Salt was accumulating in the lower lakes. The lakes fell to 1.1 metres below sea level or 1.4 metres below the previous recorded minimum level in 1967. The sediments in the exposed lake bed turned acidic and immediate action was needed to try to protect high conservation areas and minimise acidification. The 1996 decision by governments to cap uh, water use was important. Whilst it stopped the growth in diversions, it was not successful in making sure that our level of use was actually sustainable in the long term. In 2002, the Living Murray First Step decision started the process of recovering water to reconnect the Murray to its floodplain and to the sea. The Living Murray addresses the watering requirements of only some of the most important and iconic wetlands in the Murray. There are still thousands of key wetlands in the basin whose future relies on more water being available specifically for the environment. Sometime in my adult life, we went past the point where our use of the basin's water resources ceased to be sustainable. We've eliminated so many of the small floods and freshes that are needed to maintain the health of the floodplain that those vast areas of floodplain are now in major decline. The basin plan is about setting the balance to achieve a healthy working basin. It is about reconnecting the rivers to their floodplains and to the wetlands. It's about reconnecting the basin to the sea. After all, everyone who lives in the basin and many more depend on it. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority encourages you to have your say about the Basin Plan. To do this, go to the website mdba.gov.au for details about the feedback process. We look forward to receiving your thoughts. You can also find more information about the Basin Plan on our website. Thank you.